Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to welcome each and every one of you for today's conference, uh, for the th uh, conference theme, which is Challenging Emotions in Today's World, Mechanism, Challenges, and Solutions, Neuroscience and Psychology, Series Number 8. So now, uh, before I proceed, I would like to welcome all of you once again, because I can see a lot of familiar faces. And uh, I would like to thank each and every one of you for taking out your valuable time for this conference. Thank you. Now, I would like to make a humble request to everyone to kindly switch off your phone, or you can put it on silent mode or airplane mode to avoid, to avoid any interruptions during the uh, session. Right. Um, please allow me to introduce myself. I am Kunga Chindin, the program coordinator of Tibet House, cultural center of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, New Delhi, and I'll be moderating the today's uh, today's first session. So, on behalf of Tibet House, cultural center of His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama, I would like to extend our warm welcome to our chief guest, Mr. Abhijit Haldarji, Director General of International Buddhist Confederation, and our Guest of Honor, um, Professor Amar Jiva Lochanji, um, who is the Foreign Students Advisor and Joint Dean of International Relations, University of Delhi. Our keynote speaker for today's conference, Professor Bindu M. Kutiji, from the Neuroscience Perspective, and who is a Senior Professor of Neurophysiology Department and Officer in, officer in Charge of Center of Consciousness Studies at National Institute for Mental Health and Neuroscience, and our Venerable Geshe Doji Damdula, Director of Tibet House, Cultural Center of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, New Delhi, from the Buddhist perspective, and our esteemed chairperson, and all the speakers, and to all the participants who are gathered here for the conference. Thank you very much, everyone. Now, I would like to request our chief guest, Mr. Abhijit Haldarji, Guest of Honor, Professor Amarjiva Lochanji, our keynote speaker, Professor Bindu Kutiji, and Venerable Geshe Doje Damdula to kindly light, light the lamp of knowledge and wisdom. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, may I request all of you to kindly take your respective seats on the dais. Thank you. Um, now I would like to I would like to request our director, Venerable Geshila, to kindly present the white scarf and the souvenir to our chief guest, guest of honor, and our keynote speaker, Professor Bindu Kutiji. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Abhijit Haldarji, our chief guest.
our guest of honor, Professor Amarjeeva Lochanji. And our keynote speaker, Professor Bindu M. Kutiji. Thank you very much, Kishila. All right. Um, all right, before I begin this session, um, I would like to mention that Tibet House continues to follow the vision of His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, in organizing this one-day conference on challenging emotions in today's world, mechanism, mechanism, challenges, and solutions, neuroscience and psychology, series number eight. So now, before we begin with the actual session, I would like to int briefly introduce you all about Tibet House and its activities throughout the course of year. Tibet House New Delhi was established in 1965 by His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama of Tibet for the purpose of preserving the cultural heritage of Tibet at the time when it faced extinction in its homeland, as well as for providing a center for Tibetan culture and Buddhist studies. His Holiness the Dalai Lama's recurring emphasis on developing a sense of universal harmony and compassion as its own effective antidote to global suffering together with the needs for a meaningful, meaningful exchange between different religious and cultural tra traditions also had a profound effect on the purpose and its activities of Tibet House. Tibet House aims to bring together Buddhist masters and Tibetologists, people across different disciplines, students and practitioners, and the common men through its various programs and events. Tibet House continues to expand its objective in saving Tibetans' heritage and in exploring and working towards Tibet House's potential contribution to the ethical development of the modern society. Over a period period of five decades since its inception, Tibet House has come to be recognized as a significant institution for the dissemination of Tibetan culture and for Buddhist studies. Now, Tibet House has a library, as we can see the picture, um, a museum, and various study programs on Buddhist philosophy, conferences, or interdisciplinary subjects such as neuroscience and Buddhist psychology, quantum physics, spiritual ecology, and universal ethics. A publication unit which publishes several books in a year and the program division, which regularly organizes lectures, seminars, conferences, film screenings, and exhibitions, and also conducts Nalanda Dharma studies in Tibetan language. Tibet House also offers four different courses on Nalanda Buddhist philosophy and Tibetan language course. Firstly, the first batch of Nalanda Master's course, which was launched on 9 December 2016 on the occasion of 51st anniversary of Tibet House, New Delhi, in the gracious presence of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, along with Sri Kiran Rijiju Ji, the Union State Minister of Home Affairs, and Sri Najib Jung, Lieutenant Governor of Delhi. The first batch of Nalanda Master's course, batch number one, is completed with 372 students from 44 different countries. The second batch of Nalanda Master's course on Nalanda Buddhist philosophy has already has already started in the uh, in July, in which around 900 participants are enrolled from 54 different countries. And I would also like to mention that during the time of um, COVID outbreak in the year 2020, we still continue to disseminate the Nalanda teachings through online mode, as we have received numerous emails, suggestions from various students across the world. So our director, Venerable Geshe Dojan Abdullah, graciously accepted the proposition and made the maximum, maximum if effort to continue 
the vision of His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama. Secondly, the Nalanda Diploma course was launched on 2018. Three batches has been successfully completed so far. Nalanda Diploma course, which is a 14-month course, this course is designed specifically to accommodate people who are more seriously interested in Buddhist philosophy while being in the midst of a busy schedule with other engagements and commitments. Till now, we have successfully completed with three batches and the fourth batch of the Nalanda Diploma course, NDC4, is now being offered both offline and on, uh, online. And I would also like to mention about the recent audience with His Holiness, the 14 Dalai Lama for which we were very fortunate to have this audience. Uh, on 2nd June 2023, close to 500 students who have recently graduated from and currently studying in the Nalanda Master's course and the Nalanda Diploma course offered by Tibet House New Delhi received a gracious audience and blessings from His Holiness, the 14 Dalai Lama, and oral transmission of J. Rinpoche's in praise of dependent arising. At present, there are more than 4,000 students from 98 countries enrolled in the courses run and under the leadership of Venerable Geshe Dojin Abdullah, Director of Tibet House, Cultural Center of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, New Delhi. Tibet House also offers Tibetan language course on a regular basis. There are four levels of learning offered at a very nominal fee with special discount for students and monastics. Till date, 24 batches have been successfully completed. We will, complete, we will soon complete the 25th batch of the language course this month and the registration for the 26th batch will begin in the month of November and the actual course will start from 1st December 2024. Now I would like to call upon our secretary Mr. Tenzin Kunjapla to kindly address the gathering and begin the session. Thank you very much everyone. Uh, good morning ladies and gentlemen. Uh, respected uh, Mr. Abhijit Haldarji, uh, Director General International Buddhist Confederation, uh, Professor uh, Amar Jewalajanji, Foreign Students Advisor and Joint Dean of International Relations, uh, University of Delhi. Our keynote speaker, uh, Professor Pinto Kutiji, uh, Neuroscientist and Dean, Basic Sciences Dimhans, Bangalore. Uh, Venerable Keshe Toji Tamdullah, uh, Director of the Tibet House Culture Center of His Holiness at Dalai Lama, New Delhi. All the respected and uh, esteemed uh, speaker and chairpersons, distinguished guests, and uh, all the participants and students who are gathered here today. Uh, it is with great pleasure and immense honor to extend a warm welcome to the conference on challenging emotions in today's world mechanism, challenges, and solutions. Uh, this conference serves as a vital platform for neuroscientists, practitioners, and Buddhist philosophers to come together, share knowledge, and engage in a meaningful dialogue on the subject that has become increasingly pertinent in our modern day lives. In today's world, where emotions often run high, where the challenges we face can feel overwhelming, and where the need for understanding and managing our emotions is paramount, this gathering could not be timelier. Uh, we are fortunate to have a distinguished lineup of experts and speakers who will delve deep into the mechanisms underlying our emotions, the unique challenges they pose, and the innovative solutions that can help us navigate this intricate terrain. As we embark on this intellectual journey, I encourage you all to embrace the spirit of open inquiry, thoughtful discussion, and exchange of ideas. Let us harness the collective wisdom present in this room to gain new insights, uh, challenge the conventional thinking, and collaboratively uh, seek solutions to the emotional challenges of our time. His Holiness the Dalai Lama saw Buddhism and science as different methodologies, methodologies with a similar aim to investigate nature and reality using knowledge gained to improve the quality of life. In 1987, His Holiness the Dalai Lama initiated the Mind and Life Conference that first held at the residence uh, at Dharamshala. Six scientists, two interpreters, and His Holiness spent five hours daily 
or sharing views and discussion of the sciences of the mind. I am confident that our discussion will not only deepen our understanding of the challenging emotions, but also inspire us to find compassion-driven solutions that can positively impact our societies. Uh, I wish you all a productive uh, en uh, enlightening conference. And without further ado, I request our program coordinator uh, to proceed with the event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kunjabla. Um, now I would like to request <coughs> Mr. Abhijit Haldaji to kindly address the gathering. And before that, I would like to give you a brief introduction about Mr. Abhijit Haldarji. Mr. Abhijit Haldarji served in the government of India for 37 years and retired as special secretary in Janu January 2022. Served in Indian missions in a number of countries as part of diplomatic service. Presently, he is the Director General of International Buddhist Confederation, IBC. He has dealt with Buddhism and specifically Tibetan Buddhism over the years in India and abroad. Having associated closely with Buddhist communities, organizations in India and abroad, especially in Buddhist nations, and has a strong understanding of the present-day underlying dynamics within the Buddhism mat matrix. As Director General, IBC, effectively coordinates India's Buddhism narrative with various India, uh, India-based and international Buddhist organization in coordination with the Ministry of Culture and the Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India. He was the, he was the lead coordinator for the Global Buddhist Summit 2023, which was held in, in the month of April in New Delhi. Now I would like to take this opportunity to request uh, uh, Mr. Abhijit Haldarji to kindly come up on stage and address the gathering. Thank you very much, sir. Namo Buddhaya. Good morning to you all. It is indeed a pleasure for me and an honor for me to be present here on this very important occasion when we are going to have a seminar during the course of the day on a very critical, very vital subject of uh, Neuroscience, Psychology, and Buddhism. Um, I must thank uh, the Tibet House and especially Venerable Geshe uh, uh, Damdul specifically for organizing this event and giving me the opportunity to uh, open this particular seminar. But this is a subject which is very intricate and complex. And uh, over the ages, over the years, over the centuries, people have worked and researched on it. But, uh, you know, we are still a long way to go. In the overall context, I have personally been fascinated and always amused by this interplay between the mind and the brain and the action that a human being takes. Eventually, at the end of the day, it is this aspect which uh, is responsible for the existential condition in which we exist today. The world, the world order, the fact that I am here, you are there, and there are people all around, the community, the society, the nation, the world over, everything is connected and derived and linked to this critical aspect of the interplay between the mind and the brain and the body and the conscious self. Well, at the outset, I must mention that I'm not an expert on this subject, but uh, every opportunity that I got during my travels uh, through different countries uh, to listen to people uh, who are experts on this subject, I would make it a point to attend those lectures. Uh, it was interesting to note that people with different backgrounds, different cultural traits, different uh, uh, heritage, different value systems uh, tend to look at this particular topic in their own different way. So, so this is very interesting that this is again a place where the mind and the brain is acting differently. While you're studying mind and brain, but because of your cultural traits, because of your habits, because of your different value systems, you're looking at the subject from a different perspective. But that's also very interesting. 
subsequently of course over the years i uh, got uh, involved with the concept of uh, or the idea of how buddhism has been associated with uh, uh, this whole concept of uh, neuroscience and uh, mind and brain uh, consciousness etc but then i i you know the the vagaries of the government's job is such that you don't get a chance to delve into the subject in detail as much as you would like to do but little did i realize that when i would retire i would end up with this organization called the international buddhist confederation so somehow the buddha got me back here in this position and uh, of course uh, got a chance to interact with a wonderful set of people who are experts on this in this particular field especially people like uh, venerable geshe damdul and the others uh, in the ibc when i joined i thought we must do something concrete and substantive on this particular issue on this particular topic and uh, we started making a very humble beginning by uh, putting together a set of people uh, who are neuroscientists uh, based in different countries a uh, brilliant lot who've done research for 20 30 40 years and who are also associated with dhamma or buddhism and aware of uh, the buddhist narrative to this whole topic so we are trying to put together a small team uh, we are at a very preliminary stage and uh, we hope to uh, be able to contribute something substantive something concrete something really uh, worth uh, uh, noticing by the government by the human community uh, in terms of mental health in terms of human well-being and uh, as we build up uh, this particular project we will of course lean on uh, the tibet house and people like venerable geshe damdul for their support because of his expertise in this field uh, i have put together a small paper which i would with your permission want to read out because uh, you know being in a in a in a congregation of brilliant people i would i don't want to be looking less knowledgeable so i thought i would i should do my homework and i had to uh put together something which i thought is my perspective on emotions and as we look at emotions from the point of view of buddhism as well as modern science so please do allow me to uh present the paper buddhism and modern science are compatible as both encourage the impartial investigation of nature and share commonalities in philosophic and psychological teachings Buddhism and science also have potential connections in areas such as neurosciences, psychology, consciousness, quantum theory, etc. However, Buddhism and science are different in their history, in their world view, in their agendas and goals as Buddhism focuses on ethics and enlightenment, while science focuses on understanding the laws and the principles of reality. Friends, the very concept of emotion resides predominantly within the realm of experience making it inherently challenging to provide a concise definition similar to the notion of well-being as we call well-being it remains profoundly subjective in nature the definition of emotion with this premise established it becomes pertinent to delve into the known facets of emotion from a psychophilosophical standpoint It is beneficial to explore the recognized dimensions of emotion. According to Buddhism, essentially emotion can be regarded as a feeling or a sensation. This is referred in the Abhidhamma as Vedana. And this feeling and sensation that emerges within the mind is a reaction to a specific situation or object concurrently permeating the body. This phenomenon can be understood as an instinctive responsive behavioral pattern triggered by either pleasant or unpleasant circumstances from a medical perspective emotion constitutes a state wherein hormones associated with pleasure such as adrenaline or those linked with discomfort like cortisol are released into the blood stream due to a stimulant factor according to medical literature these elevated hormone levels compel an individual to react to the situation with either positive or negative responses conversely in the context of buddhism a favorable 
or unfavorable feeling initially originates within the mind as a response to a situation. Subsequently, it manifests as a corresponding sensation within the body. These sensations then drive the individual's reaction to the given situation. A groundbreaking revelation from a Buddhist viewpoint is that our reactions are directed not towards the external object or circumstance that triggered them, but rather toward the internal feelings they engender. Often, due to our unawareness, we erroneously attribute our behaviors to external factors. This is also why different individuals may respond diversely to the same situation, as the emotional response is contingent on their perception of the object. A positive perception begets positive feelings and vice versa. Thus, altering our perception can lead to a shift in emotion. Individuals who cultivate awareness of their emotions face the choice of suppressing or expressing, suppressing or expressing them. Expression can manifest through verbal or physical means, that is in the form of a body language or both. Suppressed emotions retreat into the subconscious, resurfacing at a later stage, while expressed emotions accumulate in the subconscious, intensifying and amassing similar material. In essence, whether suppressed or expressed, these emotions accumulate, eventually erupting or accumulating to manifest as psychological or somatic ailments, or both. The impact is more pronounced with negative emotions such as greed, hatred, anger, vengeance, jealousy, etc. Positive states, too, can manifest as psychosomatic conditions and enhance physical and mental well-being. However, positive states, although seemingly commendable, can evolve into negativity when circumstances turn unfavorable. From a Buddhist perspective, the eradication of all emo emotional aggregates, so-called sankharas, is imperative for authentic well-being. The Buddha outlines various methods for achieving this, with vipassana meditation practice holding a prominent position. According to Buddhism, we are born with or accumulate emotional aggregates throughout our life. While perception influences the emergence of corresponding feelings, pre-existing emotions from previous experiences shape our perception of the object. This disparity in perception underscores that a single object is not uniformly perceived by all, nor is it consistently perceived by the same individual over a period of time. Buddhist teachings assert that all emotions are inherently transient. To mitigate or to subdue them, Buddhism suggests broadly four paths. The first being to cultivate awareness, that is, mindfully acknowledge their presence, the presence of emotion. Secondly, to recognize their arising, the arising of emotion, that is, remain non-reactive and equanimous, understanding their transient nature and dependence on compulsive reactive patterns for sustenance. Third, nip them in the bud, nip the emotions in the bud. Intercept emotions by refraining from reinforcing them with reactive tendencies. So don't react to them. Just observe or watch them, but don't react. The fourth is prioritize mindfulness of their emergence, which means alongside recognizing their transient nature, exercise willpower to restrain reactive patterns. If emotions have already materialized as ailments, they can improve if the primary emotional aggregates responsible for them diminish. To effect this change, one must sharpen and fortify the mind through tailored contemplative practices. The same principles apply to positive emotions. It is noteworthy that these emotions too lack inherent desirability as they tend to eventually devolve into negativity. Vipassana meditation and other contemplative practices are prescribed pathways to liberate the mind from both positive and negative aggregates. Vipassana, known as the path of purification, is a pragmatic approach to letting go, letting yourself free, letting yourself go, transcending theory for practical application. The Buddha eloquently elucidates this concept in the discourse known as Salatta Sutta in the Samyukta Nikaya, when he says with the simile, when he compares with the simile of the arrow, the bow and arrow, the arrow. He presents an analogy where external conditions or internal issues strike us like arrows. 
causing harm, causing damage, causing injury. Ignorantly, we launch a second arrow by reacting to the first arrow, compounding our injuries thereby. A wise individual refrains from challenging emotions, for no emotion can overpower the discerning. All emotions, fleeting and frail, lack inherent strength. They are actually weak. They have no value. They don't have any credibility. And this is something which you have to ingrain in your minds while dealing with emotions. Our, our ruminations or physical reactions magnify their dominance. Recognizing their ephemeral nature and withholding reinforcement leads to their eventual dissipation, leaving behind tranquility. In the context of evolving insights into the origins of emotions and their influence on health and well-being, the medical understanding of hormone release remains subject to debate. Research has yet to definitively establish whether elevated hormone levels, such as cortisol and adrenaline, actually cause or correlate with existing emotional states in the mind and body. The Buddhist theory regarding emotions and their capacity to induce illness challenges, illness challenges contemporary comprehension of disease etiology and progression. In the end, I must say that uh, all of this, while we have uh, uh, researched on the senses, the, 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 the emotion, the anger, the jealousy, uh, the anxiety, the stress, etc., boils down to the game of the interplay between the mind and the brain. The mind is extremely critical. As the Buddha said in the Dhammapada, that all phenomena are a result of the nature of mind. And the mind is the chief which precedes all phenomena. He further says that if with an impure mind a person speaks or acts, suffering follows him like the wheel follows the ox. Similarly, he says that if with a pure mind a person speaks or acts, happiness follows him like his never departing shadow. And we all know today that mindfulness training with discipline, with diligence, can lead to functional and structural changes in the brain that can heal many mental and physical illnesses. And friends, uh, today we live in a world where there is a lot of anxiety and stress, hell of a lot of anxiety and stress. If you look at the nature, if you look at the climate, if you look at uh, the havoc created by nature against mankind, especially over the last five years, it is absolutely uh, unreasonable, illogical. That's what we tend to claim. I mean, the forest fires taking place in different parts of the world, floods happening in places which are generally known to be drought prone. Uh, cold countries are witnessing high temperatures. Uh, we had the tsunami, which was a unique phenomena when the ocean literally took over the land. We had the COVID. I mean, look at this. I, there is an endless amount of uh, uh, negativity which is in the air. And this unfortunately has triggered or calibrated our mind, the human mind, to expect or to get prepared for negative things to happen. Today, if you're sitting in this hall and if there's a slight tremor, slight tremor, 10 years back probably, if there was a tremor, you would just sit peacefully and just walk around and ask people, kya ho hai? that kind of thing. Today, when there is a tremor, you just see the reaction. Because your mind is geared to all the pictures you've seen of the earthquakes which have happened in Turkey and Ethiopia and, uh, uh, you know, uh, all across the world and, and Morocco, etc. And all of that comes back. There's a lot of image. There's a lot of vis visible vision which is flowing into your mind, into your brain, which is uh, sort of clouding your thinking. So you just panic. You, you, you start thinking in terms of the next and the next and the next. What is going to happen? There was this grade 10 and 11 students in a school who were given this situation about very interesting topic of mind and brain. In a very brief way, they were explained and they were told to, uh, you know, uh, imagine uh, various scenarios in which they are caught. So this particular example was given to them that if there is a slight tremor here, what will you do? What do you think is going to happen? Please write down two pages. And everything was negative. One, one person had written that the roof is going to fall. My friends are going to be killed. I will survive. I will barely limp and go out. Look at the negativity. I mean, I would expect him to say that, you know, we'll muster strength and go out and, you know, save ourselves and work together. But the mind of a child 
who's in grade 10 is clouded with negative thoughts because what he's seeing around you and what the nature is doing to you. And like the Buddha said, nature gives you back what you give nature. It's simple as that. It boils down to, again, the mind and the brain, the human mind and the brain. What have we done as human beings to the nature that the nature is showing its angst against us? You know, it, it needs deep thinking. So, um, I will now uh, end by saying that uh, uh, there's a lot of work to be done in the coming time for people like us, especially, uh, you know, uh, researchers and uh, 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 neuroscientists as well as uh, professors from different universities who are putting in a lot of effort and of course uh, 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 friends from the brothers and sisters from uh, the Dhamma uh, background uh, we have at the rate of 40 seconds one suicide taking place in the world today 40 seconds every 40 seconds as you clock there is one suicide happening somewhere else that is the pathetic state of the society and 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 if you look at that, there's a long way for us to go. A lot of things to do. Uh, I wish you all the best. I wish the conference uh, every success, and I'll be listening to uh, the debate and discussion with utmost attention. And thank you once again, uh, Tibet House and Venerable, for organizing this wonderful event and keeping on this series. It's a brilliant uh, effort on your part, and we will try to join in our efforts and do whatever possible to enhance your strength. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Abhijit Haldarji. Um, I convey my sincere appreciation and gratitude for the wonderful and inspiring words, which really keeps us intact and motivates us to continue to excel ourselves in this field and also for sharing your knowledge on the on today's conference theme thank you very much um now i would like to call upon uh, our guest of honor professor amarjiva lochan ji um to kindly address the gathering and before that i would like to brief you um about him professor amarjiva lochan ji teaches at delhi university and is the joint dean Interna of international relation he is also the foreign student advisor of Delhi University. Professor Lochanji is the president of South Southeast Asian Association for the Study of Culture and Religion. He is governing council. He is the governing council member of India Center for Migration (ICM), um, which falls under the Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India. He has been appointed in the last November as the advisor of the Buddhist projects. ICCR. Professor Lojanji also serves in the Ministry of Culture and Education Ministry in var various capacities. He looks into the issues of Indian diaspora, Indian uh, Indic elements in Southeast Asia, and Buddhism. At the UNESCO, he has just been appointed as Vice President of the International Association, Association for the History of Religion under CIPSH UNESCO, and he has traveled to 84 different countries. Professor Amarji, Amarjivaji, thank you. Tashi the lake. I have just been made tall. I'm not that tall. Someone put some plate below me. And then I am reminded by the August presence of this gathering. It's a great pleasure to have Geshela, a friend of last life. And he has promised to be next life too. And ever green, ever dynamic Sri Abhijitji, who has been leading an arena of learning, unlearning certain elements which has made Buddhism slipping out of the country. And he is surely going to bring us back in thoughts, work, and activities. I am proud of his activities. At the same time, among all these fit enough people, including the chief guest, the chief speaker, the, the real doctor among them, we are all doc. You can change the spelling of C to other type of letters. I'm very grateful, sir, for giving this opportunity to be here. It's always a pleasure to speak to before a gathering of Buddhist 
leanings and understanding. And I'm sure this uh, 10 minutes allotted to me will be important for me to learn by going through emotions which I'm seeing on your faces now. I deal with many Buddhist students and Tibetan majorly and I have learned a lot by your class attendance because I can see your smile have sublime touch and I know how what you are feeling now. And being a topic on emotions which is hand, handled today, I am full of thoughts of different vibes. Some of them sir, was related to your earthquake story which happens very regularly now. And then I was thinking, which is the most safe place in this hall? I found this corner being very safe. So I was very faster to go there. But I was also thinking of you. Don't believe me, I'm so much uh, negative. I could see you have very, very good safety. And all of 49 people here I counted. And I could not count all. 36, 72 people are here altogether. Would be very safe. Be assured of that. So don't pay attention anywhere except me. Uh, coming to... The topic today, there is a big challenge for all of us. And it is very serious to know that uh, we do not take Buddhist terms and terminology in the meanings of what they are made for. We always go by translatable words which we find somehow created in 1860s, 1930s. And some of the words of Buddhism came in English language in 1960s also. So I don't know how to translate the word emotion. Should I go for the emotion, the meaning what we feel every day, the reaction of the mind or action of the mind? Or if I go into the details of learning Buddhist tenets and details, we find, uh, should it be called klesha? And uh, if we go deeply into a little bit more into Buddhist mode of philosophy and, and understanding, should we call it Brahma Vihara? These are the challenges before us. While thinking, I was continuously, Geshela, I was talking to myself. And I really want to tell all of you, please be very careful about this English Buddhist term synonyms and creation of the word's meanings. What is the answer to that? How to translate emotion? How to go for that other words? How you can translate Brahma Vihara, Kalesha? If you translate in the modern meanings, entire North India Klesha means fighting at home. Patni Klesha deti hai. And this word is very much in Punjabi. I went into Punjabi vocabulary. Klesha has been a very ancient word, but very usually, very regularly used in the Punjabi language. Klesh mat karo. It means should not do emotion. No. How can I stop my emotion? Buddha himself says, do not stop emotions. Emotions are very important. So we have to remember the words in many sectors of Buddhist learning. We have to be very careful before we translate into their English and uh, French uh, synonym like that. So be very, very attentive to that. That will solve your entire problem. Of So what should we do? We should use the words what is mentioned in Sanskrit and Pali literature and Buddhism. We use that one. We have been successful in the last century. Only two, three words have been brought into the issue of non-translatability. One is that yoga. Till 1990s or even 2010, I can tell you, yoga was never called yoga. It was called meditation. Thankfully, now nobody talks about meditation. Meditation because meditation and yoga is not the same. It's a very big for yoga to know the yoga. So please. Again, remember, all Buddhist terms need respect from us. We need to go by their meanings. We should quote that word in that meaning only, in that uh, spelling and uh, pronunciation only. We don't worry about the translation. In translation, going you go, you lose a lot. So this is my emotional outburst for the day. Uh, you know, emotions are the entire source of understanding Buddhism. And it has been felt in uh, Tripitaka that Buddha is talking, especially in Sutta literature, talks about human psychology. And he, deliver, he delivers lecture depending on the location and the group of people sitting with him. If he's talking about Krishaka, Kassi, Bharadwaja, he's talking about farming and mind farming. You know how he connects with that. 
he's talking to another Pindaka group, he's talking about how the money can be best utilized. See, this is the beauty of understanding Buddha's words into this form so that we understand how he is carefully talking about mind and mindfulness. You know, in fact, mindfulness is also, I, I really doubt about that it can express the entire feeling of the power of Buddha has given to us. It is very difficult to say that. So when we go to uh, understanding the basic understanding of emotion in so-called meaning, we start with klesha. Six types of klesha have been generally mentioned in Buddhist literature. Uh, no need to talk about that. Everybody is knowing about that. It includes so many negative thought also. Klesha is also having anger and also ignorance and drishti. And when you talk about drishti in the modern meaning, drishti means viewpoint. But in Buddhism, it's not viewpoint. When you have something which gives you not a satisfying uh, lifetime or uh, thought line, false notions, it is drishti in Pali on Sanskrit. So drishti, again, you have to be very careful about understanding drishti with the modern drishti of uh, today's klesh at home. So this has to be also taken care of. So these are six klesh he talks about. These are the nurturing grounds of understanding and helping people to be healthy. When we talk about healthy in Buddhism, it doesn't mean uh, away from uh, medicines and tablets. It talks about your heart being full of compassion. Again, compassion is a wrong translation of karuna. Karuna cannot be translated into compassion. It's very little meaning compassion. Karuna is very wide, very, very wide. But uh, unfortunately, I am also trapped into that kind of translation game. So I use the word karuna better than using compassion. So when we talk about this, we three, we feel that emotion need to be controlled. If you go by modern medicine system, uh, Madam will be telling more about that. The doctor gives you medicine to suppress. You get analgesic effect on your body and you feel you are cured. You know, this suppression is not permitted into emotional understanding of our life, full, full life and uh, mindfulness. So here Buddha says, you please do not keep your uh, emotion inside, make it open. And it is very much relevant when you see if some casualty happens at home and you are crying for the departed person and soul. And it is very shocking things happening at home and then you find someone coming to you giving some solace. And you feel very angry that time. If somebody touches on your back, you will feel very difficult about that. I have been given two minutes time more left. Okay. So I'll I will not be going into that. So but when you talk he when you take out of anger, whenever I get a message from anyone who has lost mother or some family members, I really request him or her, please do cry more. When you cry more, the pain of missing and absence will disappear. So this is what we, Buddha says, do not keep, express, share, which help you. And I'm sure there are many great uh, learning moments to come very soon with the doctor around. I'll just end with one line without going into Brahma Vihara, which was my very favorite topic for today, that if you are practicing meditation of whatever ways, whatever taught by any guru or that guru, you will be happily keeping all medicinal doctors away in your life. It's not a question of one apple a day keeps away, you know. It is one single meditation or two minutes will be keeping away. And I wish all of you just keep heart and then you see how Heart Sutra helps you by just reading. Just read Heart Sutra. Just simply read it. And this Hridaya Sutra will be giving you a beautiful Hridaya and mind. I'm sorry, time is limited. Thank you so much. Great pleasure to see all of you. Namaskar. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, Professor Amarjiva Lochanji. Now I would like to give you a brief introduction about our keynote speaker, Professor Bindu M. Kutiji. Um, Professor Bindu Kutiji is a senior professor of Neurophysiology Department and a former professor and the head of the Department of Neurophysiology and officer in charge, Center for Consciousness Studies, NIMHANS, National Institute of Mental Health and Neuroscience. She has 30 years of experience 
in teaching and research in neurophysiology at Nimhans. She has also established the Center for Consciousness Studies at Nimhans in 2019 with a mission to build a platform for undertaking multidisciplinary research in the domains of science, humanities, and culture pertaining to the consciousness by integrating Indian philosophical wisdom with neuroscience. She has received many honors and awards, such as Professor S. L. Bhatia Oration Award for the contribution in neurophysiology research and teaching in 2022, and many more. She is a life member of Association of Physiologists and Pharmacologists of India. Uh, now, may I request Professor Bindu Kutiji to kindly address the gathering? Very good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Venerable Gishala Ji, uh, for the opportunity given uh, to be here during this wonderful conference. Uh, and uh, we were actually looking forward uh, to come and participate in this conference. Uh, so today, uh, uh, I will be speaking about, uh, from the neuroscience perspective, the challenges uh, on uh, emotion in today's world. Anyway, uh, my previous speakers, uh, Dr. Haldar and Dr. Lojan, they have already uh, simplified that they have given details of the emotion, what is emotion. And so I will straight away now go to the neuroscience. So as you all know, um, hundreds of years, I mean, almost at least a century back, uh, we didn't have any idea about brain, mind, and behavior, the relationship between brain and mind and brain and behaviors. And brain was uh, generally considered as an unapproachable black box. But still, over more than a century back, the neuroscience of uh, emotions, cognition, and social behaviors have started with uh, the life of Phineas Gage. And Phineas Gage has uh, taught us uh, very nicely through his life, through his uh, uh, social interaction, through, through his uh, behaviors that damage to some of the brain areas, especially the prefrontal cortical areas, uh, lead to emotional, cognitive, and social deficits. So this was the first uh, observation that uh, helped us to understand that brain regulates many of these behaviors, especially the cognition, emotion, and social behaviors, social functioning. Uh, and why we need to have emotions? That's a very important question because emotions, we are enriched with uh, plenty of very richness of emotions. And these emotions are very important for um, uh, adaptation to environment as well as for proper social functioning. The social functioning is a very complex process and it is very important for a uh, success of our, you know, like behavior. And how do we achieve this? Actually, uh, if you look at the brain evolution, uh, the complexity of the brain has been evolved just to cater the needs of social demands. Uh, so that is very important. That is what uh, the theory of mind also talks about, that you have the mental ability to talk, that to, you know, like you have the metacognitive abilities to think about your own thought state as well as to think about others' thought states. So these all teach us that social functioning is very important and emotion and uh, uh, cognition play a major role uh, in regulating these emotions. Now, over the years, uh, with the help of advancement of many technology, you know, we were able to understand the brain processes of uh, cognition and emotion. And now we know that there are efficient brain mechanisms uh, to process various aspects of emotion. When we talk about emotion, like emotion perception, emotion expression of uh, behaviors, emotional experience, emotional regulation. So all these are there. Like we, we have very efficient mechanism that anyway in the subsequent speakers they will be discussing in detail. Uh, but I will just uh, brief you about one of the, this is one of the mechanism. Like this is uh, uh, from our studies only. So, uh, you know, like we can study the various uh, brain mechanisms. See, for example, uh, some of the wave patterns, we call it as uh, early posterior negativity, EPN, that is originated uh, at the visual, the initial visual processing of the uh, emotional stimuli itself, as well as uh, the late positive potential. 
so you see that it can distinctly differentiate you know the emotional processing the negative processing you look at that the negative processing positive processing and lpp never uh, respond much to the neutral um, stimuli so now we have a very efficient mechanism to understand various aspects of uh, emotions now so what are the challenges the challenges as already the speakers already talked about the challenges especially we live in a 24 into 7 society we lead a very hectic lifestyle especially our nightlife is very active so this compromises on sleep so and being a, we are being the sleep scientist i will be talking mainly from the these challenges from the perspective of sleep and sleep sleep is very important for maintaining health and uh, well-being it's very important we need to have enough sleep to make us to be very active during our daytime and efficiently carried out all our functions so what happens if there is if the sleep is compromised definitely that will be reflecting on various uh, physiological functions and that will affect the uh, emotions and cognitions uh, so the sleep abnormalities associated with this uh, uh, this kind of you know like uh, sleep deprivation uh, due to hectic lifestyle itself there are studies have shown that almost 30 percentage of the population in the world is uh, sleep deprived and with this uh, we also uh, got to know about the various the prevalence of many sleep disorders there are many many different types of sleep disorders like insomnia parasomnia and all and also uh, if you look at if you study the sleep abnormalities sleep abnormalities are seen associated with the substance abuse addiction uh, age related problems and uh, uh, along with anxiety depression these are all anyway part of the neuropsychiatric disorders um, uh, chronic stressful events like ptsd so you see that sleep is an important component uh, of our daily life and if sleep is uh, uh, compromised, definitely that is seen on our uh, behavior as well as on emotion cognition, as well as that leads to various comorbidities like uh, uh, cardiovascular dysfunction, immune dysfunction, hormone dysfunction, and so on. Uh, so altogether that the sleep deprivation reduce uh, uh, work productivity, sociability, psychological wellness, and also it is en enriched with the negative emotions. That is the main, you know, like a negative aspect of uh, or uh, the, uh, the that reduces or that affect the quality of life. For example, so uh, naturally we ask the question, what are the neural signatures of sleep deprivation? and how it uh, impede the cognitive functions so in general i would say that uh, it uh, the it impede the integrity of all network functions you know if you look at brain network functions there are major network function like uh, central executive network function that carry out or that is associated with the cognitive uh, functioning uh, dmn that is uh, a default mode network associated with the self processing as well as mind wandering and uh, uh, salience network so you see that there is a beautiful interaction between these uh, and uh, you know while in under normal condition whereas this entire integrity is lost during sleep deprivation and accordingly then you can see that the you know the various aspects of cognitive deficits like for example uh, the uh, that also that study from our own lab that we have looked into the cognitive uh, potentials uh, like p300 p300 is an event related potential so you can see that and that is associated with your cognitive abilities especially the attention and memory aspects of the cognition so you see that how nicely the p300 is affected uh, in insomnia the same way sleep uh, uh, the neural signatures of your emotion especially like uh, how uh, uh, the reward system is affected uh, during sleep deprivation uh, you know there is a it uh, uh, there is a hypersensitive uh, your reward system, uh, system become very hypersensitive that is mainly because of the hypo functioning of the cortical regulatory mechanisms so when the cortical regulatory mechanism is uh, damaged is dampened the rest of the mechanism takes uh, you know like uh, up and because of this uh, hypersensitized reward system uh, there is an enhanced that leads to enhanced impulsivity increased risk taking like gambling and these kind of behaviors enhances 
as a result of uh, impaired reward system. And a reward system, as you know, that dopaminergic reward system is very important. Dopamine is very important for um, for various motivational aspects of our behavior, for various reward-seeking behaviors. So uh, there is a disruption of this uh, dopaminergic functioning. And this disruption of dopaminergic functioning definitely uh, leads to uh, uh, various other behaviors, like leads to craving, appetite dysregulation, obesity, drug addiction, substance abuse. Uh, so you see that uh, just one, you know, like uh, just sleep deprivation, how it uh, just uh, impact the whole uh, entire brain functions. Uh, even definitely the same way the emotional uh, uh, mechanism, emotion regulation mechanism is also uh, affected severely by uh, uh, sleep deprivation. That is, um, uh, again, once again, uh, there is a dampening of the cortical uh, regulatory system of the prefrontal cortical uh, uh, input to amygdala. And then accordingly, there is enhanced amygdala reactivity um, and uh, defective functioning of the salient network. So again, once again, you can see that uh, that affect the entire emotion processing system that uh, uh, impede the contextual information processing. And for example, you know, when if the subject is presented with a neutral sub, uh, stimulus, neutral face, uh, they can perceive a threat or fear from an normally, you know, it, it, did, uh, it do not elicit any threat or uh, fear. So you see that uh, they are, you know, there is an inaccurate perception of uh, 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 this uh, perception from the environmental stimuli or even improper allocation of attention resources or poor discriminatory accuracy. So there are a lot of, you know, like this, most of this uh, emotion processing are uh, affected by sleep deprivation and you can see all these. So defective, definitely uh, uh, defective emo emotion regulation. And that is mainly due to this uh, maladaptive generalization of fear response uh, to commonly. So you can see that the perception is towards a negative side. Like, you know, you will not see an enhancement of positivity here, everything. So if the whole uh, emotion processing system is uh, affected, uh, that leads to total, total negativity, like negative effect. It leads to uh, ultimately leading to anxiety or depression uh, and other uh, behavioral consequences. Uh, so I will just share with you some of our own studies. For example, the recently, uh, uh, you know, like we are, we have faced a lot of difficulties in life uh, due to COVID pandemic. So this COVID pandemic itself, people have perceived as a threat. And uh, some people, you know, like they couldn't cope up with uh, uh, these stress events. And uh, we have just looked at, this is a survey study, and we have looked at only the sleep, uh, um, whether they have normal sleep or and if they don't have normal sleep, how that sleep abnormalities affected their emotional pro I mean, emotion as well as uh, the quality of life. And we have seen that almost 33 percentage of the people are, you know, sleep uh, affected uh, by uh, COVID uh, pandemic during COVID pandemic. And uh, that leads to a lot of uh, uh, daytime impediments like uh, excessive daytime impairment due to intrusion of sleep during uh, daytime, negative emotionality, increased rumination, worry, feeling of worthlessness, fear, so many. Like you can see that uh, all negative emotions. And when the, the negative, this becomes a vicious cycle, like daytime that uh, uh, impeding the function will affect the sleep quality in the uh, um, uh, subsequent sleep. We have also looked at, we have also undertaken a survey study using, um, uh, uh, just to, to study the relation between the sleep quality, emotion, as well as the dreams. Suppose if the sleep is affected, how their dream content will be, what will be the dream content, and how this sleep quality and the dream content influence your daytime uh, functioning. And uh, this, we have carried out this survey study um, on those uh, individuals who are contracted with the uh, COVID pandemic. And uh, so many, almost a thousand uh, uh, people have participated in this study. So it's a very big study. And uh, we have seen a beautiful relationship between poor sleep quality and how the poor sleep quality leads to uh, negative dreaming. Like why the negative content of the dream, like bad dreams, uh, nightmares, and uh, that definitely will lead to early morning awakenings. 
And definitely this leads to excessive daytime sleepiness and negative emotionality. So you see that uh, the whole quality of life goes down just because the sleep is uh, um, uh, affected. Um, so now as uh, my previous speakers said, see, for example, now how, what are the solution for this? Like, you know, there are, there are many ways we can uh, overcome this uh, uh, negative aspect of our life. Uh, through various processes like uh, psychological approaches, meditation, neuromodulation, rehabilitation, various behavioral approaches, and look at uh, how the brain can be rewired. Anyway, brain has uh, brain is endowed with a phenomenon of neuroplasticity, and uh, this uh, uh, rewiring and reorganization of the neural circuitry is uh, very much possible. Uh, so we uh, have also looked into the various aspects of sleep among the vipassana meditation. So we have undertaken very long studies on uh, vipassana meditation practitioners themselves. What will be their kind of you know sleep organization? And we found that uh, uh, the meditation practitioners uh, they have a beautiful sleep organization. Like uh, their uh, slow wave sleep, the REM sleep state, all are you know very perfect, and uh, the sleep duration, and there is no intermittent awakenings. Sleep is not interrupted. They have a very beautiful consolidated sleep, and also a beautiful REM sleep organization. So all these are indications of not only that sleep structure is perfect, also the underlying physiology. For example, sleep is very important for various functions like memory consolidation, emotion regulation so many emotion stability so all these so this reflects that you have a very good night sleep and you are perfect you can function and uh, the next day very well so uh, the proper social functioning is ensured with the sleep quality um, and also we have undertaken studies to see that usually aging we see that aging associated changes in not only the sleep structure but also the sleep quality and both are compromised you can you know like we see that even at the age of 70 meditators never showed any age associated changes yeah and definitely the sleep quality is improved because of the meditation uh, enhances various um, hormones that affect uh, that or that is very important for uh, sleep maintenance and sleep initiation like dhea and uh, uh, melatonin i will just go fast um, and also sleep um, the heart uh, you know health health of your heart cardiovascular system is uh, assured among meditators so all these we can study uh, i mean we have uh, looked into uh, among the meditation practitioners and so in total meditation practice enhance attention control emotion regulation awareness enhanced awareness and reduce dmn activity especially during performance during cognitive uh, performances during sleep so you see that uh, these uh, you know reorganization of the whole system prevent the rest of the aspects negative aspects like rumination you know like uh, anxiety so we can overcome these through these kind of techniques and we have also I, I just thought i will just mention we have also carried carried out a study on um, anxiety um, generalized anxiety uh, patients with uh, social phobia so generalized anxiety disorder with social phobia, they have got very severe anxiety and sleep is impaired. So what we have done, we have carried out a study using two co a combination treatment, like see, for example, Ayurveda treatment, Ayurveda drug like Manasamitra Vataka, along with uh, the conventional psychiatry drug like Lonasipa. So what happens? And we looked at, we studied and we have observed that even Manasamitra Vataka, it's an Ayurveda formulation, but still it has uh, equally, it it is um, equally potent like clonazepam as far as the anxiolytic, it bringing anxiolytic uh, uh, properties. And but over uh, clonazepam, we have seen that this uh, uh, Ayurveda treatment enhances. They help to preserve slow wave sleep and uh, uh, promote sleep. So we see that sleep promoting qualities using Ayurveda uh, formulation than clonazepam. Clonazepam uh, usually impede sleep. So there are, so uh, this kind of treatment or approaches also definitely will help us to overcome. So I'll wind up this, uh, uh, my talk. See, for example, uh, and, uh, you know, for every culture, there are, uh, you know, uh, like some methods will be embedded in the culture also to overcome various uh, 
um, um, our emotional problem. One of the example is uh, the Senoi tribe, one of the happiest and the non-violent people on this planet with near perfect mental health. So how do they achieve this? This is a very big question and a very big lesson for us to learn. That is the Senoi mothers, they teach their children, they encourage their children to dream. Uh, in the night and uh, then the next day they encourage them to assess to discuss the content of the dream and this process helped them to overcome all the worries and fear and uh, uh, and this simple process uh, they are transforming a society uh, transforming the you know enhancing the individual well-being as well as the social well-being so these are the lessons we have to learn and definitely the uh, the principles of ubuntuism this um, it's an uh, uh, like an african uh, philosophy means humanity uh, that is uh, so they learn to you know like uh, they learn the exist uh, like the message or their uh, the through this kind of philosophy they learn that the interdependency is very important and through interdependency they can they can identify and manifest their own qualities and uh, you know, develop various leadership qualities. And I would like to mention here that uh, His Holiness, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Dalai Lama, he has introduced, he has started this um, uh, youth interfaith uh, uh, pilgrimage program and it taking Karnataka as a model state. And we, Nimhans people are associated with that. Uh, we conduct one day a mind science program for them. And uh, uh, talk about uh, this uh, kind of philosophy of uh, uh, interdependence. So here I will wind up uh, with this uh, slide that our brain, our brain basically a cognitive and an emotional brain. That's all. We have to survive. We can survive with this. But if you if you mind, you can transform this brain into a moral or a uh, spiritual brain and through various processes and all this. So that means the brain has the capacity to transform. And uh, there are many, many emergent properties you can see. For example, through meditation, uh, we can uh, look at the various aspect of uh, FM, that is uh, frontomedial theta. Uh, frontomedial theta otherwise will not be there in any common normal you know, functioning, only through meditation process or something, uh, that kind of lifestyle, a spiritual lifestyle you follow, you can see that these kind of uh, properties are emerging. That means the entire uh, neural properties can be reorganized and uh, you can, you know, like you can experience the various higher uh, mental qualities like altruism and compassion. Thank you so much for patient listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Bindu Kutiji for such an enthusiastic talk on the theme. Thank you very much, ma'am. Now, um, I would like to brief you about our keynote speaker from Buddhist perspective, Venerable Geshe Doji Damdula. Venerable Geshe Doji Damdula is currently the director of Tibet House Cultural Center of His, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, New Delhi. While being assigned with the responsibility of the direct directorship of Tibet House, he also gives regular lectures and leads philosophy classes in Tibet House and other places as well. He travels widely within India and abroad to teach Buddhist philosophy, psychology, logic and practice. He has also worked on several books. As assigned by the office of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, he visited US in 2008 to work with Professor Paul Ekman on His Holiness the Dalai Lama's book, Ethics for a New Millennium, Part 2 and the book series Art of Happiness, which were jointly written by His Holiness the Dalai Lama, such as The Graded Path. He has written a number of papers for national and international conferences on topics such as The Paradox of the Brain and Mind, An Ultimate Reality According to the Arya, According to Arya Nagarjuna. He is currently in the process of writing two important books, one entitled Journey into the Paradox of Brain and Mind, and the other what constitutes the ultimate reality, the effects of understanding the ultimate reality. Now, may I request Venerable Geshe Doji Damdula to kindly come up on stage and address the session. Tashi <clears throat> Dilo, all of you. 
First, I'll say a verse or salutation to His Holiness in Tibetan, followed by a salutation to the Buddha in English. And this by great compassion, you taught immaculate dharma to dispel the, the perverted views. To you, the Buddha Gautama, I pay homage. Um, respected our chief, chief guest, um, Mr. Abhijit Ji, and our guest of honor, Dr. Lajan Ji, and a keynote speaker from the neuroscience point of view, Professor Binduji, um, and uh, all the participants here, all the participants and all the observers, and particularly um, over the span of the last many years since my taking over as the director of Tibet House since 2011. Uh, now I see that more and more youngsters are involved in these conferences. This is extremely encouraging sign and very happy. And of course, I like to, it's so good to see my very long time friend here, Benerji, here, uh, from His Holiness's the liaison officer. Yes. Um, so welcome you all here, and um, in fact, what I uh, see, why this topic is selected for this is that as the all the earlier uh, presenters, all the, the speakers, our chief guests, our guest owner, and Dr. Binduji so well explained the complexities, how the complexities and the complications, the problems, anxiety, stress, and the conflicts in the world, in the families, in the nation, in the world, how they arise, how they are increasing, and um, so everybody has the responsibility in their own ways to see how to mitigate the intensity of these problems. And um, in this connection, I see that the earlier. The, the presentations, the extremely relevant, and I would say that what we heard thus far is more like the synopsis of what we're going to hear the next few sessions. So, as the um, UNO, so we may talk about, say, for example, when I was in school, meaning like thirty years ago, when many of all these young boys and girls were not yet born. Um, when talk about education, to my mind, and I'm sure many of the youngsters in those days, um, somebody's educated means somebody has somebody goes into to become a medical doctor, like a psychiatrist there, and then the uh, or engineer. Whereas if you go into the let's say the psychology and so forth, it's like what we, the impression that we had was that something soft science, not really the core of the science. But today we see very different. Not only today, this reality that we think about these, so finally the, this, the, the global entity, UNO. So what, where this entity, this, the, the, uh, the group, United Nations organization. Where do what are the areas which this organization uh, focuses on? So we see that. Look at this: Sustainable Development Goals (SDGs). This is a very important point being discussed in UNO. It's not about in a small school, in a small family. It's discussed in UNO. So what is Sustainable Development Goals? At one point. 17 of them are highlighted. And then the well-being being discussed by the earlier presenters. The well-being, this is a very important thing. And people, when we talk about, particularly I would say the, the people more into the, the hardcore academic uh, studies, when they talk about the well-being, this is a soft topic. Uh, they, they may not really touch. But UNO is concerned about this, the well-being. So they define, as Dr. Binduji rightly 
at the site of this, what the, how well-being is defined by UNO. So it says WHO and the UNO said, a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Meaning that, so in the early days, like 40 years ago, 50 years ago, what is well-being? If physically, if you're fit and fine, the way the manner in which the medical doctors see you, then this is well-being. But today, the, the humanity has really developed to such a height to see the well-being in a broader context of the well-being, not only of the physical the well-being, but the mental and social well-being as well. And the, okay, so uh, the, I like to skip these points. Then the, say we talk about the well-being. What's the problem nowadays? The problems, we have to discuss the challenges, the problems of the world. We see that the cases of anxiety is increasing exponentially. So we see the anxiety disorders, um, the 301 million population of the world, and they have the anxiety problem. So it says that it exponentially increases all the time. And also depression, these are very severe problems. 280 million people of the world suffer from depression. And uh, the, in fact, just for information, depression is not only confined to the non-believers, even to the believers. Not only to the believers, even amongst the believers, we see that uh, some who are really learned people. In fact, I, was, I may as well say that some of these, the clinical psychologists, they need the attention. They need, uh, they need to be taken care of by the other psychologists. This is a problem. So what I'm saying is that only if you have some experience of what depression is, then you can really empathize with other people. We really need to work on this. Otherwise, the when the one does not have the experience of what depression is, uh, the tendency is, oh, look at this person who is a big scholar in Buddhist philosophy, Hindu philosophy, Jainism, Christianity, and so forth, and still he suffered from depression and he's deep, 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 to the extent of committing suicide and so forth. This means that the person doesn't know what is depression. And depression, there are many factors. Okay, so likewise, look at all these things. The, the whole topic for this program, for this conference, is the challenges of, of the our emotional challenges in this world today, and how they rise, the mechanism, and what are, what are the sources, and how to deal with these, are the the remedies to overcome these. So I look at these. These are the challenges, and then if you do see that you go to, you go through these problems. Then we have the speakers here, were already presented earlier by the early speakers and the speakers to follow. So we see that the answer is coming from them. It doesn't mean that there's only one answer. There are many answers. And you and your relatives, in fact, it is, it is also is as if like it is my job. Every day, early morning, I get messages. People are going through deep depression, stress with their children, with their parents, with themselves, and so forth. And the what are the solutions? So this is why we convene this program. So again, to go a little deeper, I say the anxiety in the te the, the, the the teens is increasing exponentially. It's extremely sad, and the it is say look at these. There are three factors identified. The one said that high expectation and the pressure to succeed from the family members, individually, and for the, from the community and so forth. And also that we see that, I say, the, with the technology advances, where the, the pace of the life becomes so fast. Um, we see the, okay, this is so important where there's incredible development in technology. Um, it doesn't mean that the, the, the citizens of the, the particular country or the world, they are happier. Because the citizens, it is like, say, the, a horse and the horse rider. 
Say the horse is running so fast, and the horse rider has to catch the horse, and he, he runs very slow. He cannot run fast. So the horse is the metaphor for the technology that we're using. And the people who are using this technology, they are like the horse rider. So when the horse rider cannot run as fast as the horse to catch it, then the horse rider is a problem. So many people go, they go through depression, anxiety, and stress, and so forth, because that their mind, the brain, they cannot really run as fast as the technology. And yet, amongst the, the population in the world, we see that there are many who are brilliant, and they can run as fast as the technology. So what about the rest? The rest would lag behind. And then they see that we are nowhere in the community. So there's expression which says that the, in the workplace, they don't get people. Meaning, they have so much positions in the workplaces, but they're not getting the, the people to work there. And the people, they don't get work. You understand what I'm saying? Because the nature of the work is such that you should be extremely competent. You should be extremely fast. And yet, the pace of the, the people's mind is not necessarily increasing. While technology is increasing, it is developing exponentially. But the pace of the thinking of the, the people, it is not increasing. For example, all these books, now the, the publications, earlier times, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, the publications, they say from a very standard, the, the uh, publishers, we see that hardly you find any typos. Now, the books are, the books that don't come through, say, the, what, what is that? You know, in the earlier, you put all this, you know, the, for the publication, you pick up the, no, you, you do the, you know, all these individual typesets, individually, you have to pick up the letters, I, A, M, H, A, P, P, Y, I am happy. Now, finished. And mistakes are more likely to be made. And then we think that we can, we are developed. Now the books come with a lot of typos. This is a problem everywhere. Because our mind cannot run as fast as the technology. And we are using the technology. So, now think of we should really empathize with the rest of the population. Don't think of only the genius, the, the gifted people. Oh, now the, 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 the world is developing. The whole country is developing. But believe it or not, minimum 50% of the population in the country is suffering because they cannot catch up with the technology. And the whole country, the whole world is now trying to run on technology, modern technology. So there we should really think of how to, to, to mitigate the intensity of the, the potential anxiety, stress, depression, at least in the minds of the 50% of the population world. So now, is there a cure? This is a question. Is there a cure to this problem? Individually, we have the problems. Okay. One-tenth is not done. I have just two minutes. Okay, if there is a cure or not, uh, this question. So, to make it very quick, what I'm going to present in the following can be summarized in this, the, um, the screen sharing. So, basically, what we see is that the um, Charles Darwin, Charles Darwin, his book, in his book, um, what did he say? that 2008, as the uh, Kungala read my CV, um, 2008, I was working with Professor Paul Eggman on the Book of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, quoted by himself. And uh, there, the, I was there with him for five days uh, to work with this book. And uh, he was so generous, so kind to entertain um, so well for the next five days. And every evening there is some program that he organized and one was to meet with his psychologist friends or colleagues. And then he asked me to introduce myself, what I do to his colleagues. 
And we, I talked a little bit about the Buddhist concept, how to mitigate the, how to mitigate and eventually how to get rid of the destructive emo emotions. And one psychologist, lady psychologist, raised her hand and said that, but we cannot get rid of these emotions, attachment, anger, and fear. We cannot get rid of these for the reason that these are instincts. These are evolutionary gifts. These are instincts. You cannot do anything with these. And on top of that, we require these emotions. For example, whole purpose. What is the whole purpose of the, the species? Whole purpose, what's the meaning? The purpose of the species is for the is for the continuation of the species. That's a purpose. It's for this reason that according to Charles Darwin's evolutionary theory, the young, the young generations are so important and old generations, they don't care. Meaning that you have done a job. Now the younger ones are very important because they, they will continue the, the species. So this is Charles Darwin's evolutionary theory. So on that basis, that, the, uh, that these emotions, what they call as instincts, they're required for our survival. Without attachment, you will not put effort to bring together the conducive factors for your survival. If you don't, say for example, you feel hungry and you don't feel attached to getting food, you'll not work. And then with hunger, you die and your species will come to an end. And with a fear, if you don't have fear, say that the, um, okay, let's say the, the tiger comes to pounce on you. And if you don't have the emotion of fear, you will not put effort to run away. And if you don't run, don't run away, again, the tiger will just eat you up, finish, your species stops. So this is uh, the Charles Darwin's evolutionary theory, with, where it says that, there is no way by which can, number one, we can get rid of these emotions for the reason that these are instincts and these are developed over, over 4 billion years from our, the initial ancestor, the unicellular organism, which happened 4 billion years on the planet Earth, where the water was formed after the Big Bang, after the, the Milky Way galaxy exploded, then the sun, sun exploded to form the, uh, the eight planets or the nine planets. And finally, 4.6 billion years ago, the sun exploded to create this, this solar system. Four billion years ago, the water was created, water came into existence, and the universe, you, the, uh, the unicellular organism came into existence. So that was our ancestor. So from there till today, the last four billion years, and particularly to be more precise, 0.3 million years with the advancement of the Homo sapiens, the emotions came to existence. And these emotions, they're required for you. So about this is a gift of the evolution. We cannot get rid of this. This is the Charles Darwin's evolutionary theory. So it says that emotions are instincts through evolution. We cannot get rid of this. We require that. Whereas the Buddha taught it very differently. Yes, these emotions are the instincts. We can say they're instincts which means they're innate. And can we get rid of them? Yes, we can get rid of them. Don't we need them? We don't need them. Because what for do we need them? For survival, we can survive way more effectively without these destructive emotions. What is known as the compassionate or skilled compassion. Skilled compassion, how the mother does to the, how the mother makes the children survive through the skilled compassion. So where there's compassion there, the mother will make sure that the children get the conducive factors for the survival, number one. The mother will make sure that the, the, the threats are gone rid of out of love and compassion, not out of anger. So the Buddha taught that it is through this, uh, the skillful compassion, that we can succeed, very effectively succeed in creating the happiness within yourself and expanding your happiness to others. Okay, I'm, not, I'm just going to skip this, skip this. Okay, there some of these photographs, I'll skip this. So overall, what I'm saying is that people, we are being too naive, or overall speaking, we're too naive, thinking that, okay, what is education? 
education means something hardcore, academic, uh, the, say, the very complicated concepts or complicated how you put the same, same simple concept, we could put it in very academically jargons, right? And then people get lost. And you think that, oh, this is a great author. No, look at the world. The world is very different. Look at the world. Look at this. What is it? Aims. What is aims? It's not for our fun. So look at this. What are the farmers doing? Right? We talk about party. We talk about, what is that? Starbucks and so forth. Where did Starbucks come from? Where? These are the people. They are putting effort. What is this? Look at this. Look at this. There's no fun there. There's so much of deep sadness there. This is reality. So we cannot override these realities. We cannot just shirk these realities and then be go into the world of the fantasy. This is optical delusion. This world. Okay, so with this, as the, the as of the previous speakers, I dealt upon the distinction between the mind and brain. Of course, this is a very interesting topic, and uh, the the moment you go into this area on the be on the be on the basis of blind faith, then the whole the beauty of this discussion is lost, defeated. Whereas if you really explore this by studying what the neuroscientists are saying, by studying what Acharya Dharmakirti, 7th century great Indian Buddhist philosopher or Buddhist logician or epistemologist, what he was saying. Comparing, contrasting, you see that this incredibly beautiful journey of exploring what the, even for the academic purpose, this could very interesting journey. So I'm going to just skip this. Okay, so the question is, so with all the challenges, how can we possibly escape from these challenges or how can we remedy these challenges? So the Bodhisattva Shantideva, a great Indian Buddhist master, brilliant philosopher and an incredibly compassionate being. So what he said is that, that all our challenges, all the challenges of the emotional challenges, uh, they come to get, they come into existence on the basis of two factors, external factors and internal factors. And by coming together of the two factors, like the two hands coming together, it erupts, it, or it explodes the sound of the clap, which is a metaphor for our miseries, the problems, anxiety, stress, and so forth. So they should necess necessarily come into being by the two factors, external factors and internal factors. And some people, they say that, okay, so I'm a medical doctor, or say I'm a, say the, a professor, or I'm a, the CEO of a company. Or, and then later on, you see that your classmate, who was no one, suddenly start a small business. And you, you earn like, let's say, one lakh per month. And you are the, who, who was way less respected when you were in school. And everybody respects you and you are earning maximum one lakh per month. And this boy or this girl, so there, starts to start a small business and earns like one lakh per day. Right? Wow. Right? So, what am I doing? This is a question. So therefore, where lies your stress? Where lies your happiness? Getting one lakh rupees per month, is it happy? And seeing you of me, yes, you are very happy seeing that others are earning just 10,000 10, rupees per month. You are getting one, one lakh per month. You are so happy. Seeing your friend, just who was no one in the school, while in school, earning one lakh per day, right? Oh, I'm just so inferior, right? Then the pain starts. So we see that just one lakh per month is not happiness, it's not suffering. Something is wrong there. Creating pain, something is wrong there. So this is something internal. It's not external. External means the same. It's just one lakh per month. That is, maybe some, some of you maybe one lakh per month, right? You may think that it's a clear points. Okay. So this is there. Then what about the other side? 
okay, some people are happy with one leg per month. Some people are very unhappy with the one leg per month. So as the object is the same, external factors are the same. If there's a difference, the difference is internal factors. These are the wise people. The wise people are the people who look for the internal factors which are responsible for creating the pain. Yet, it's not purely internal, internal, external, both are there. And yet, to dealing with that, a primary hovers around the dealing with the internal. Okay, so this great, great master, what he said was that, where would I possibly find enough leather? Let's say that, oh, I want the whole Delhi, I want to walk very comfortably, barefooted, whole Delhi. And then yet you see that there are the, the what, the broken glasses there, the apples, and then they prick you. Oh no, cover the entire earth with the, the mattress, entire Delhi with mattress. So, is it not, that is not really possible, covering the, the entire Delhi, entire India, entire world with a mattress is not really possible. But cover the two tiny feet with two small pieces of the, the mattress that suffices covering the entire earth with the mattress. So this is what? Trying to cover the, the external world is like trying to deal with the external world, external factors. And covering your two tiny feet is like dealing with your internal factors. So wise people, so how do we demarcate between wise people and the unwise people? Unwise people are those people who look for the, the solutions outside all the time. And who are the wise people? Those are the people who look for the lasting solution internally, at the same time, not negotiating to, to the mitigate the power of the external factors, working on both and predominantly working internally. Okay, so there are, all these are beautiful uh, the, the, uh, the insights by this great master, Bodhisattva Shanti Deva, and I'm going to leave this PowerPoint Anybody who's interested, you can take this PowerPoint for your own use. Okay. So here, all these verses that are related to how these destructive emotions arise, how this mental disturbance arise. Knowing that, and I'm quickly just share with you. I say I see that there are many psychologists. There are many young psychologists with the daughter Rizvi. Yes, totally these students, I can see that many of you are here. And for you, say how the these I'm quickly give me two minutes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Because that there are many young students, they they should know this. This is very important. It's all about the psychology, how the mind works. On this basis, say the, how your destructive emotions arise and how they can be managed. So before I go into the technicality, the first thing is that, say, when some people with, when the parents, they bring the child with an emotional imbalance, they come to me, they come to me, um, they, first I check, first I check, don't ever think that you can solve all the problems. A psychologist should not think that you can solve all the problems. Psychiatrists should not think that you can solve all the problems. And the, the neuroscientists should not think that you can solve all the problems. Because of this, we require neurologists, we require psychologists, we require psychiatrists. These three different the experts are required. Because one person cannot treat the, the, the patient completely. So I just check the, the, uh, the, the person, the patient, and if I see that the person does not have the capacity to listen to me, no point talking is a waste of time. So you send him to psychiatrist, give some antidepressants. So let this hyper state of the mind not being able to pay attention, that should come down. Once that is calmed down, once you've already started the, the antidepressants, psychologists, you are not a person to say, that, okay, now you're getting, getting better, stop the medicine. No, you are not a person. You have to advise the, the patient that you can stop the, the medicine only in consultation with the psychiatrist who gave you the medicine. You don't have the right to say, to say that, we stop the medicine. Some people, they are too naive. Even I would say that the, within Buddhism, within, the, within Hinduism, 
I see they are like they within Buddhism some lamas, within the Hinduism some you know pandits. They said that no, stop that the medicine. Then the person can really become it can really get out of control. It's very dangerous. You are a lama. You are a great teacher. You are a great pandit. You don't have the right to say that you stop the antidepressants. You give the counseling, and if you think that the person's become better, tell the person go to your psychiatrist and ask if you can reduce or you can stop the medicine. If the psychiatrist says no, don't stop it. But the psychiatrist, the psychiatrist should be a good psychiatrist. You're getting it? Again, there are many levels of psychiatrists. Okay, I don't want to go too much into that. Now the point is to make it very quick, is that how the problems arise. They are, some can be genetics. Some can be because of a problem with your brain. Some can be because of this psychological. There are many factors there. And we are not to think that I can deal with the, all these problems. Because if it is genetic, you cannot deal it, the psychologist cannot deal with it easily. If it is brain damage, psychologist cannot deal with it easily. So it is purely psychological. Psychiatrists cannot do anything. Psychiatrists can numb the person, right? Both emotions, positive and negative emotion, both will be numbed by the antidepressants. So you have to check what's the problem. Once you identify the problem well, now what I'm saying is that most of the problems today, which are non-existent 30 years ago, and now, as we read all along, that there's an exponential increment in anxiety, depression, so forth. So which means that it is primarily psychological. So where is the psychological problem? Because there are many psychology students, I'd like to share with them these problems, how they arise. Think of what we what I identified as the uh, the five to one mental factors. Five to one mental factors. This would be extremely important. Okay, look at this list. Look at this list. Uh, the five to one mental factors. And I hope that in the following the the sessions, there are some scholars who will speak more in detail of the five to one mental factors. And in other words, the functions of your mind. How do your mind mind functions? So there. We see that of the few, I'm not going to go all. The first one, the first step of five, what is called as the five ever present mental factors. So, where your mind operates, these five are operating. It doesn't matter whether you're Buddhist or not. You're getting it, oh, this is a Buddhist mind operating five, right? Say, so for example, some people are too naive. Oh, it's a Buddhist concept, right? So, also, it's a Buddhist bread. No, there's no, there's no Buddhist bread or Hindu bread or the Muslim bread. You're getting it? Bread is bread. Whosoever eats it, your hunger will go away. Right? So, have seeking happiness is, is what holds true across the board of the humanity. Not on the board of humanity, the board of sentience. So, the point is that the how does the mind operate? And how does the, this depression builds up? How does the depression build up? And how does anxiety, all these come into it? So, let's say that for example, you are at very, very peacefully sitting there, and you said, "Okay, today I'm the the is my off day, so I'm not going to work on my computer. I'm just just focus on myself, just sit peacefully." And suddenly, somebody who you dislike, or somebody who is who is being jealous of you, who is being unhappy with you, the person passes by. Instantly, the disturbance comes. The person even didn't know that you are here. Right? The person even doesn't know that you are here, but all already disturbance happens in your mind. How does it happen? And if this disturbance, if it is extended, prolonged, it's going to be depression. If it is intense, it's going to be anxiety. So this is how it works. How does it work that what is really happening inside me? The person is not the person does not even see me, but already within me something's happened. So how did it happen? Five points. Number one, the contact. Your eye consciousness, your mind comes in contact with the object, the person who you, with whom you have a problem. Number one, the contact. Okay, I don't know. Oh, yes, I do have it. The number one contact. Then, is it that complicated person? You pay attention to this, or I'm. It, it is just the. I'm like dreaming. No, it is the real person. 
paying attention to number two, then the number three, discrimination. Mentally, you say that, yes, this person is the one who I dislike or the person who doesn't like me. Number three, discrimination. Then what happens? Number four is the feeling. What's the feeling like? Unpleasant or pleasant feeling? Unpleasant feeling comes. You're getting it? Do you like the pleasant, fe unpleasant feeling? You don't like it. So say, the, um, the, did you see a s small video clip? A small child? A small child, a baby in a baby chair. The mother gives a food. And the baby looks at it. And knowing that this is not what he, what he likes, he pushed it and he cried in a baby chair. Maybe age two or three. Then the mother gave the end of the food, a different food. Again, the baby looked at it, again cried. Three or four times. Finally, the mother I put a wand of glass there. And the baby Luther was so happy. You're getting it? So happy, accepted it. So there, look, say so the baby came in contact with this, the, the first food. The people rejected it because the baby uh, may not be alcoholic in the past life. Or maybe alcoholic in the past life. So therefore, he does not, he's not interested in the other food, only in just wine. So no, there's unpleasant feeling comes. So, unpleasant feeling, the baby does not like it. Unpleasant feeling. What creates the unpleasant feeling? This food. So, push it. Push it. So, the, when unpleasant feeling comes, and the intention to push it. Last one is intention. Intention to push it. So, push it, and lucky is the mother. If it is an unknown person, the person will say, hey, eat it, or I'll slap you, right? Then the baby does not like this food. But if somebody forces the baby to eat it, then the baby continues to resist. There's a resistance inside. You're getting it? This resistance, if it is intense, it becomes anxiety. For example, if instead of this food, if it is the cyanide, you have to take the cyanide. And you know what cyanide is. What happens? The, this disturbance will manifest in the form of in the, the anxiety. Intense. And if it sustains for too long, like five days, 10 days, 20 days, it becomes depression. It manifests in form of depression. So these problems arise on the basis of these operation of the, the five points of how the mind works. And that is true, that holds true to everyone, not to a male, not to a female, but to everyone, not only to male or female, to everyone. Now, how does this fix this problem? You have to fix the number five intention. Instead of resisting, you make things, you allow yourself to embrace. How to now don't force other people that now don't, don't resist, embrace everybody. No, the mouth not. If you want to embrace, this will happen only by a corresponding cause. What is the cause of possible embracing? Intention is intention, embrace will happen only if the, the feeling is pleasant. You're getting it? Don't say pleasurable. Pleasurable is. Most in most cases is associated only with the physical. So even with the word happiness, many people they don't like this word happiness because they associate the happiness with the the pleasure, physical the joy. So it is a pleasant feeling. And you create the pleasant feeling because the pleasant feeling is the cause for giving rise to the intention to embrace. You're getting it? So if you want your child to embrace things rather than resist. Create a pleasant feeling. How to create pleasant feeling? Discrimination. Discrimination. Information that you get. Information that you get should be something which is the ability to do to trigger the pleasant feeling within the person. For example, say the say person is a very nasty person. But this is one, then the metal, the heart palpitation happens. And then it was actually a prank. You know what prank is? The prank. Actually, your brother, your sister, your mother, your father, who put on the mask of the that the person who you dislike. And the, the, your mother removes the, the mask, and you see that it's my mom, right? And so your mind embraces. You're getting it? So contact with the, desert, the object, and you see that this is my mom discrimination. And pleasant feeling comes, and you embrace your... What is the sign of embrace? Is that your mind simply calms down. This is the healing. 
Okay, uh, so don't worry, I'm done. But this computer is not working as fast as I like. So look, so the um, finally what I really like is I like this photograph. This is as old as 10 or 12 years ago. 10 or 20 years, the 12 of, 10 or 12 years old photograph where we took part in a program where the students from the different religious groups, Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, Christians, I don't know about Jain, there must be a few Jain there. And there's a collective, collective effort of coming together and perform the programs, the perform these dance perform the performance in the last the the point in the, the point of the program. And then we had a say like two or three days program, beautiful program, huge um, the auditorium in Chandigarh University, the Punjab University, as well as in Jammu University. In Jammu, it's a beautiful thing. So I told the gathering, I told the gathering, which is like huge gathering, the auditorium filled. I said, in the same place, bloodshed happened several, several decades ago, bloodshed happened. And if these generations were to look back in time today, the younger generation, they will feel ashamed of what you are doing today. You are being inclusive. You are coming together. Muslims are performing. Then the Hindus, Buddhists, Christians, they're clapping. Hindus are performing. The Muslims, Christians, Buddhists, they're clapping. It's amazing. This is the power of the youth, power of the sensible youth. So let's work on this. Thank you. And some suggested ratings. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Venerable Geshe Dojit Abdullah, for such a powerful message and his uh, wonderful talk with a lovely presentation. Thank you very much, sir. Um, now, with this, we would like to, uh, before I conclude this session, I would like to thank our chief guest, Mr. Abhijit Haldarji, our guest of honor, Professor Amarji Walochanji, our keynote speaker from Neuroscience Perspective, Professor Bindu Kutiji, and our director, Venerable Geshe Dojit Abdullah, for sharing their wisdom and knowledge and introducing and opening this conference theme topic. Thank you very much. Um, now, I would, like to, um, I would like to inform all of you that we'll begin the first session of the conference, um, which states the, the uh, I mean, the theme of the conference is mechanism of arising negative and positive emotions, right? So uh, I can see that the that the theme of the topic is really powerful and very interesting. Um, and my colleague, Ms. Tenjin Domala, will be moderating this session. And I would like to thank each and every one of you who are present here. Thank you very much, everyone, for your uh, for your valuable time and your enthusiasm. Thank you very much. I would like to request uh, our chief guest, our guest of honor, and our keynote speakers to kindly uh, stay on the dais for a quick group photo. And um, may I request uh, may I request all the chairpersons uh, and the speakers of the session to kindly come up on stage for a quick group photo. <laughs> 